Hello and welcome everyone to the speaker series this week. It's great to have you. We are delighted this week to feature research that's happening out of Friedman. So this was a recommendation to feature some of our own work um, and some of the, the really fascinating um, projects and studies that are happening right here um, at Friedman, of course, and around the world. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the One Nutrition in Complex Environments study. And we are lucky to have four people to um, help us think about this study from different perspectives and share a variety of ideas about it. And then we'd love, as usual, to welcome your thoughts, comments, questions, um, and discussion at the end. So I'll I'll start with, we have our very own Ian Moore, who's a PhD student here at Friedman. Uh, and so Ian, can I turn it over to you to get started? Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, I have a mic too. Oh yeah. So I'm good, yeah. Um, cool, so we are happy to be here. We're just four members of the huge team on the one study um, in Uganda. Um, so yeah, I think it's rare to have four alumni on a panel, so that's pretty cool. Um, I've been working on the uh, project since I started my PhD in 2021. Before that, I was a master's student at Friedman. Um, Carolyn Van Sant, who's joining us on Zoom from Florida. She started a little bit before me in 2021 and also did her master's at Friedman. Uh, John Lin, his, um, started before all of us back in 2020, I think, and then came back um, during his master's program and then came back after after he graduated. And Regina's been with us for the past couple years and just graduated actually from Friedman this past winter. Cool. So we're going to um, give a little overview of the study. We'll start with some background and context for um, why the one study started um, a few years back, and then we'll give our results, but we're not going to focus too much on results. We're more focused on process uh, for this talk, and then we're going to get into detail on our research methods and takeaways, both as student researchers and kind of as in the study um, overall. Yeah, here's me. Um, this is a photo I took. Oh, well, uh, Jennifer took uh, back in 2023 when we had the last uh, training before we conduct our agriculture production survey and collection of uh, various samples. Um, I just want to emphasize that this is a huge international effort. We have team. Can we advance to the next slide? We have team from Uganda, Kenya, USA. We have team members located in Europe right now. Um, it's a huge international effort. And uh, the reason we only have um, US-based uh, uh, program people here today is due to uh, scheduling conflicts. And uh, right now it's 8 p.m. in Uganda. Um, and it's difficult to uh, transit from where you work to home. It's usually two hours transit. And uh, we are happy to have a few uh, uh, program officers who work on this program in the Zoom chat right now. So if you are here, I see desire. Uh, if you're here, please drop a heart and we'll love to see your uh, engagement and questions after uh, the presentation. Um, okay, next slide. And we have a large consortium of uh, organizations that work on this project. Uh, the project is funded by AID, um, is co-created by Go Uganda, Simit, Cornell, and Tufts. Next slide, please. Great, so now we'll get into a little overview um, of the study and the motivations. Um, so the study was in Agago district, uh, Northern Uganda. Um, so relatively small um, area. And this is a, a rural area that's uh, recovering from prolonged um, war, violence. Uh, people are have recently kind of started resettling uh, and um, mostly uh, engaged in agriculture, um, very high prevalence of malnutrition and uh, poor water sanitation um, and water contamination uh, conditions contributing to malnutrition and other diseases, as well as very high prevalence of aflatoxin contamination um, in many different uh, foods. So that was uh, kind of the, the motivation for this multi-sectoral uh, uh, study that incorporated, you know, wash agriculture practices, 
um, and other factors with the goal to reduce the prevalence of malnutrition um, in this area and, similar, and pro provide evidence uh, for the programs for similar contexts. So our kind of guiding uh, question is, uh, does enabling families, um, specifically mothers and other uh, caregivers to assess and act on drivers, multiple drivers of malnutrition through a targeted social behavior change program uh, package succeed in sustained reduction of risk factors, uh, improving overall health and uh, nutrition specifically. Um, so we evaluated, we'll get into it a little bit later, but we evaluated two uh, different programs, the NIP and the NIP Plus. Um, so the NIP is kind of a standard behavior change program and the NIP Plus has some um, added inputs of uh, connection to markets to get improved technologies like water testing kits um, and grain storage bags. Um, so we are assessing the effectiveness of both of those interventions, we were also assessing if they had sustained impacts. So we had a sustainability um, uh, measure. There was a, a year after the uh, program ended uh, to see if any effects continued uh, longer than just right after the program ended. Um, and then we wanted to you know, identify best practices so that the intervention could be uh, scaled up in other uh, complex environments. So our primary outcomes were maize aflatoxin, total aflatoxin, um, and venous aflatoxin uh, B1, uh, that's um, uh, maternal venous aflatoxin, and then water contamination, both at the household level, um, where people store their water in their household, as well as the source where people are getting, uh, retrieving their water from, which may be quite far away. Um, and we measured uh, E. coli and total coliform. We had many secondary outcomes, um, including maize yield, uh, food security, uh, diet quality, and anthropometry of children. Um, so I think Janlene is gonna give a a little bit more detail about our interventions. Yes, so this intervention is a three-arm uh, randomized clinical uh, trial. We have control intervention and intervention, and for each arm, we plan for 111. So each arm had 300 households. That's our original uh, sample size. And it was calculated based on a series of prior research and expected attrition. Um, this intervention is 12 weeks long, and we had twice weekly sessions. Each session were delivered to gender circles. Um, so it's either an uh, entire male group of the uh, expected farmers or um, the head of the agriculture uh, planning, and then or the female circles, who is expected to be the, in charge of the um, food preparation and uh, anything related, related to maternal and child nutrition. Um, the sessions were led by community members who were identified as being positive deviants, the, uh, which is referred to the NIP uh, approach. NIP, NIP approach was uh, devised by Go and it was implemented elsewhere. Uh, this study was really trying to test if this NIP approach was effective in this context. Um, next slide, please. Um, our circle sessions were social behavior change um, design and is participatory. Um, we did a micro gardening uh, demonstration. We uh, demonstrated how to wash hands uh, using soap, uh, how to test water and uh, use various of uh, agricultural inputs. Please. Um, the NIP approach uh, was uh, involving fuel efficient stoves, the processing and preservation of the food, uh, micro gardening. Um, every education model was delivered twice. Um, it's, uh, so within that module, we have WASH, we have nutrition, have maternal child uh, health. And it was all volunteer based. We seek out uh, community members who were uh, so-called uh, positive deviant. Um, and uh, 
We had circle sessions and with a recipe demonstration, all of which are necessary uh, material were provided to the participants. So the NIP intervention was uh, uh, NIP plus something else. So everything we just talked about, plus the agricultural inputs, um, the various of uh, um, technologies we're trying to uh, introduce to the household for uh, where we're trying to nudge them to buy. Um, for example, the um, hermetic bag is a um, bag designed to store maize or other uh, agricultural uh, outputs such that it will be preserved and uh, as certain moisture uh, content and, and which will reduce aflatoxin um, during the storage time period. And I will hand over to Tom. Great. So um, we'll give uh, a little overview of the results here. First, the primary outcomes looking at water contamination and aflatoxins um, at inline, and we'll show a timeline uh, in a bit, but at uh, inline was, we correct, collected data at baseline, pre-intervention, inline, right? Uh, Post-intervention and uh, one year uh, after inline. So at inline, we did see um, a reduction in the risk of E. coli uh, contamination of household water, uh, 25 percent reduction for NIP plus that was significant and non-significant um, uh, for NIP, but the effect estimate uh, was uh, about 7% reduction. Um, you can see the confidence intervals there overlapping one. Um, we did not see that continue a year later um, for water contamination. Um, we also didn't see any effect of the intervention on source contamination. This was kind of expected because the intervention was mainly targeting household uh, factors, um, not the source level um, uh, kind of issues that may, may cause contamination around the water source. Although it's possible, we thought maybe that, um, you know, that could spill over to different practices at the source. Um, and we also didn't see any effect on total coliform. Um, in terms of our aflatoxin outcomes of uh, maize and venous aflatoxin, we didn't see any uh, intervention effects. And we'll definitely talk about that a bit in a bit. But um, this, you know, I think it's especially evaluating a complex intervention like this, it's important to really think through uh, null results and not just say, okay, you know, uh, this didn't work. We need a completely different strategy and definitely not abandon uh, the principles that are in the intervention because we know that, you know, many of them have like hand washing, you know, using particular uh, storage practices. We know that they work. So we just need to think about why the intervention didn't work in this context uh, and what else is needed. Um, in terms of other wash uh, practices at inline, we did see um, a significant improvement in many um, practices, such as having a hand washing facility, both for for NIP and NIP plus, treating water um, mostly by boiling, um, and we saw um, a slight increase for NIP, more of an increase for NIP plus, and. Um, a little bit of an increase for cleaning store, uh, water storage containers. Um, I think the thing I really want to highlight here is that you can see the um, the although we did see you know significant reduction in risk at inline for E. coli water contamination in households, the uh, almost fifty percent still of households had contaminated water. Um, so there's still a high uh, burden of water contamination there. Um, and, and the you know, prevalence of treating water is still very low. Um, some of these other practices are a little bit higher, um, but could be improved. And we did see that the, the value added of the NIP plus program uh, was significantly better than, than NIP. Um, we weren't powered to 
exactly you know, compare those two arms. We were powered just to compare both of these to control, but we did see some significant differences between NIP and NIP plus. So as Ian mentioned earlier, we had a lot of secondary outcomes of interest, um, but the strongest intervention effect we saw by far was on women's dietary diversity, which we assessed as a binary indicator of whether or not women had achieved minimum dietary diversity based on 24-hour recalls. So here are the odds ratios from that those regressions. And as you can see at N-line, both intervention arms had almost two times the odds of achieving minimum dietary diversity compared to control. And it was exciting to see that at sustainability, these this intervention effect was even stronger. So for instance, NIP plus, women in NIP plus had about 2.8 times increased odds of achieving minimum dietary diversity compared to the control. And we also saw a positive intervention effect on child mid upper arm circumference, which is a commonly used um, indicator of nutrition status. And we found that at sustainability one year post intervention, the average MUAC for NIP plus children was nearly a quarter centimeter greater than that of control, which might sound menial, but to, to make any impact on anthropometry in that time frame can be difficult. So we were pleased with that result. And then we did not find any positive intervention effect on the remainder of our secondary outcomes listed here. But to Ian's earlier point, null findings is a bit of a misnomer because this is still Intel. So I think a lot of our, our papers kind of tried to dig into why we might not have seen an intervention effect on some of these other outcomes. And I'll pass it over to Carolyn. Yeah, so this is, um, so speaking back to that same thing, right, a process evaluation allows us to have a deeper understanding of sort of what is the linkage between the intervention and any outcomes or null outcomes, right? So um, what we did as part of the process evaluation is we did look at sort of the attendance. Um, so that's really what our, what we talk about dosage. Um, we're talking about, so how often did people actually attend the circle sessions and receive the intervention messages? And what we saw when we looked at the attendance was that female circles had a higher attendance in general than male circles did. Um, most women attended more than 20 of the sessions, whereas most men um, were more spread out and like, and, and mostly in the teens. Um, so then the other thing that we looked at was sort of um, several measures of fidelity, right? So we had the fidelity of form, which is really how closely does the intervention implement um, as designed, right? So the NIP program is an intervention that is um, our program that has been created and used in different contexts. Um, and what we found was that oftentimes it wasn't implemented as planned. Um, one of the things that, like one of the pieces was connecting vendors to participants. And in many cases that didn't really happen very well. Um, the next thing that we looked at was really fidelity of function. So how well was the intervention adapted to the context itself. And in this case, we did find some discrepancies as well, right? So the soil, one of the things um, that we talked about earlier sort of briefly was um, there was a piece about latrines, right? Um, building uh, improved latrines for families. In this case, the, the soil is really sandy in this area. And so for many families, they couldn't, they either couldn't build the latrine because the soil was too sandy or the latrines failed. Um, the same thing is that, so the soil also impacted whether or not seeds for the micro gardens that were, that were provided were successful. Um, and so like you end up in a situation where we provided seeds to an area and they just don't grow well. And so that's sort of that piece, sort of that piece of the intervention intervention fails. And then another piece of that was that water, the water quality kits that were used and, and demonstrated weren't readily available in the area. So these are sort of disconnects between um, what was planned in the intervention and what was um, actually experienced. And then this idea of fidelity of quality, right? It was, it, it 
it's really impacted by the fidelity of function. So what is available in the area? What can happen? What can change? The NIP program itself and GOAL in particular have a very robust um, monitoring and evaluation team. They have really good um, processes and they understand how to, to learn from what is going on. But the problem was there wasn't really a feedback loop between the meal group and the team and the project team. So while, while the meal group may have known that the soil wasn't great, there wasn't really a great way to like get that information back to the project team to make adjustments to sort of fix that solution. So really what this does is that the, this process evaluation is a really good place for us to see these links between and be able to explain the links between outcomes and the actual intervention itself. Um, so is there, you know, is there a way for us to sort of make adjustments to the programs itself? Is it that the program doesn't work or is it that it wasn't adjusted well for the context? All of those questions are things that we can sort of examine as we move forward. So if we want to go to the next slide, we're going to get into a little bit more detail about the methods. How do we collect data? What does that look like? This is a really complicated study. Um, so one of the biggest things that we had to figure out was the timeline. So like, you know, for other RCTs, right, you want a baseline measure and an endline measure. In our case, we wanted a baseline and endline and a sustainability measure, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, in practice, so in, in theory, that's a very simple concept, right? But in practice, it becomes really difficult to figure out what is the best timing for all of these data collection pieces. So I'm going to try to break this down for you. Um, we had a rationale basically for every data collection point. If you'll see here on the study timeline, the interventions themselves um, were tied to the agricultural calendar of the area. So they have a um, basically they have two rainy seasons. And in the first major rainy season is when most people, if they grow maize, will grow it in that first season. And so we had to really sort of tie back to that basic um, piece of information. We'll talk a little bit about all the data that was collected in a second. But basically, what we ended up having to do is there is a piece where we collected household um, data, anthropometry, the no ag knowledge, um, and then the water samples. So that piece we could bundle together and got baseline measures before the intervention circle started. So if you see the timeline, the circle started in April of 2021. And so in that six week period before April of 2021 is when we took a baseline measure for all those things that I just mentioned. Then um, we needed to time the end line measure to the graduations of the circles. And those circles graduated over a long period of time. Not all of the circles met on the exact same days or the exact same time. And so those circles, because they started in April and then some of them ended graduations and the last graduations happened on October 1st. And so we timed the end line measure to be... Um, five to 14 days after their circle graduation. So there was a lot of logistical challenges there to try to time that um, well. And so you'll see that there was like a longer period of time. Um, that blue bar shows a longer period of time in which we collected endline data because all of those endline um, surveys were timed to the graduations. Then we did, went back a year later. Um, and so that timeline is a little bit shorter um, for that sustainability measure. It was a little less dependent on such a small window. And so we were able to um, time that to about an eight week period of data collection. That was a year after sort of the middle of the graduations. Then we had to do venous aflatoxin. So we did take a measure where we um, measured aflatoxin levels in the blood of the female caregivers in the household. So, and it was a smaller portion. It wasn't all of the people. It was um, a smaller portion of the original 900. We won't get into that detail, but um, those had to be done by not just, um, not the same 
uh, enumerators that did the survey data collection, but rather had to be people who were trained to uh, train phlebotomists. So that those that was an end, um, a baseline and an end line measure only. And then the ag production was also included in the ag production was a maize sample that was collected and that had to be timed to how long the maize was sitting in storage. So you'll see that we only collected ag production and the maize um, sample at two time points. Those are the green bars here. Mainly that's because that first one is actually a baseline measure. So everything that happened for that maize that was stored happened at the planting season, which happened before the intervention circles started. And so everything that was collected there, all the information and the maize samples were collected from um, a time before the interventions actually happened, but it looks like it happened after. So that's actually a baseline measure. And then we came back for an end line measure a year later. Um, and again, it had to be mm -hmm. timed to this, um, to the storage of the maize that was planted. Um, and it had to be tied to the storage of the maize that was planted in season one, because not a lot of people grow maize in, in season two. So there was no reason to try to collect samples. We wouldn't have had a big enough sample size. So I know that that's very complicated. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. I will do my best to answer them about the timeline. Um, really, the point is, this is a very complex environment, and it's a complex um, uh, data collection activity. And so there was a lot of um, there was a lot of finagling that had to do with trying to figure out what was the best time to to ask for the right right information. So we want to go to the next slide. We'll talk about what was gathered in the surveys briefly. So in the surveys that we did, we did a household survey. And in that survey, we collected a lot of information about the household itself, child feeding practices, the dietary recall data, um, all of the wash practice information and the anthropometry, anthropometry um, was, was taken in that, um, in that survey. Then we did an agricultural production survey in which we asked for sort of land availability, land use, the inputs, um, and any other crop yields associated specifically with maize. Um, but we also asked about other crops in order to understand better sort of the crop mix of people's farms. And then we asked um, questions about agricultural knowledge. So in this one, we were talking about understanding of best practices, um, understanding of improved technologies like seeds or fertilizers. And so that information was asked in the Ag Knowledge Survey. If you go to the next slide, then we had several biological samples. So we took maize samples, like I talked about, of maize that had been stored long enough um, to grow mold if it was going to. Um, and then we took participant blood samples, like I talked about a minute ago. And then, like Ian talked about earlier, household and source water samples were taken. We want to go next. I think Regina is going to take back over. Okay, so... Obviously we collected a ton of data and there was a lot of work that had to happen to kind of prepare it all to be analyzed. So the first step of this was data monitoring, which we um, did every single day of each data collection period. So what this process looked like is basically each day's data would be sent over to our team in the US and we would um, comb through it looking for any potential errors in the data itself or potentially in the way the survey was administered by enumerators. And this was largely done using just a really extensive do file and Stata. And then we would flag all of these um, suspected errors and send those back to our team on the ground in Uganda. So for instance, we would say, you know, does, did household ID 10 really have a thousand goats or was it a hundred? Was it 10? You know, what's happening here? So we would send all those suspected errors back to the ground and they would kind of reconcile those with the enumerators and go through them all in the next day's debrief. So and then we do it all again the next day. So this process proved really successful. I'd say by the end of data collection periods, we were seeing far fewer errors, particularly in survey administration, um, thanks to this kind of continued enumerator training. 
we engaged in. And then despite our efforts there, there was still a lot to be done on the data cleaning front. So this involved a lot of addressing outliers, formatting, basic formatting for analysis, sometimes creating variables for analysis, as well as a lot of qualitative coding of free response questions and answers. Um, then we were finally, and of course, I'll note here, this is a simplification <laughs> of all of these processes, but you know, only have so much time. So then we were finally ready to analyze, and I'll speak for myself in saying this was a bit of an intimidating task, just given how much we were working with. But in reality, we kind of had a lot of guardrails guiding our process. So for instance, our study design dictated that we use cluster adjusted regressions, among other things. Um, we had a lot of loss to follow up, which prompted us to use multiple imputation in our regressions for our sensitivity analyses to kind of try to fill in those gaps. And then we also leaned heavily on prior research and theory in helping us decide, for instance, what covariates to include in our regression models, um, as well as, you know, cutoffs to use for biological outliers for things like anthropometry and things like that. And then we'll just end on some takeaways, lessons learned. So as you can imagine, we definitely came across some challenges over the course of this study. Um, to our earlier points, it was, it at times was difficult, you know, coordinating a global team. And I think multi-sectoral interventions are kind of inherently complex and tough to navigate in that way. So, you know, coordinating a bunch of research partners across the globe was at times challenging. We also had a decent amount of turnover of resource researchers throughout the study. So in that vein, at times, like decisions or um, agreed upon like methodology sometimes got lost or like taken with people when they left the study. So that was at times tricky. And then obviously, as you can imagine with any study and especially in a complex environment such as this one, we were definitely faced um, with some, you know, unforeseen circumstances, such a, one example is um, economic migration is very common among this population we were working with. So that was one thing we kind of had to grapple with. And then along the way, dealing with all of these challenges, we definitely learned a lot, um, though often hard to coordinate a multidisciplinary global team is so crucial for a study like this, especially having like subject matter experts in each area that the study touches proved really useful. Um, to my earlier point about kind of keeping methodology consistent along the way, record keeping, really di diligent record keeping was pretty essential for allowing for like consistent methodology. And then to Carolyn's point about the, the timeline, Study activities such as data collection, among others, really need to be thoughtfully tailored to things like um, the intervention and other relevant contextual things such as, you know, the harvest season. But in that same vein, they simultaneously need to be really adaptable to unforeseen circumstances. Um, to use an overused example, COVID, for instance. We had to completely restart the study actually because of COVID. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. so we'll just finish up with some benefits of participating in research as a student, as we all were once or still are. Um, obviously, it's a great chance to gain a like deeper understanding of how a study actually operates beyond just there's only so much you can do with theory and seeing how it actually something like this actually is carried out in practice has been really fascinating. It's also a great chance to practice up or even learn more like hard skills, like the data cleaning and management, et cetera, um, or survey design, things like that. It also, we were lucky enough to have multiple students on this project. So we had a lot of opportunities for like peer to peer mentoring, learning, teaching, all of that. And I'll end by saying even as students, you can still provide a valuable and unique perspective to a study like this, even if you're new to the field. So for instance, I joined like two years into this study's life and I think was still able to, you know, 
bring a fresh pair of eyes. So definitely don't discount your ability to kind of contribute to a study, even if you're new to it. Um, so that being said, if we have not turned you off to, to research at this point, we encourage you to get involved in any way you can. So we'll end with acknowledgements, disclosures, and see if there are questions. There are a few in it. Well, yes i have several questions <laughs> great so if you click here exactly oh perfect perfect so why don't we encourage um why oh we didn't pin the room sorry about that why don't we stop sharing and then we can you could see us okay. cool. um and then I think we have several excellent questions in the chat. So let me just see here. Control. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, and so this way you can see the speakers. Um, and so why don't we do this? Um, why don't, oh, great. Thanks, Alexandra, for solving the speaker Sorry. problem while we didn't realize in the auditorium. And so B and Elena, why don't you unmute and ask your questions so that the people in the room can hear it? B, do you want to go first? And then we'll then we'll take questions from the room. I know there might be many because I have several myself. <laughs> uh, well, I think I'm I'm just not sure I caught it, but I I thought I heard some comment about how you dealt with positive deviance. And I just I did I hear it what I thought I heard was we excluded positive deviance and I wasn't sure or I want to I believe that I was hearing that right but can you just talk a little bit about that yeah so it was the opposite we we looked for positive deviance specifically like before the study in communities people who were already like doing despite the practices kind of mm -hmm. being very rare and, you know, uh, high rates of malnutrition, people that were already doing very well despite these circumstances. Um, and they were identified, I think they were used also in the original NIP, the NIP program kind mm -hmm. of creation precedes the study um, a bit, but I think they were used there. And then they were also used to teach the um, circles, the different intervention groups um, in the study Good. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Thanks. Is that? Okay. Yeah. Yes. No, no. I, 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 when I, I thought I heard excluded and I thought. Why no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Yeah. Great. Should we go to another or go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. So. I, you also mentioned that there was some researcher turn, turnover. Was this also including these uh, individuals that were identified as positive deviants who, who gave the talks and, and such? No, uh, not as much. And maybe Carolyn can speak to that more too. But um, we were talking about the research turnover. It was more, you know, the students involved in the study. There were many other students. We, we had their names up there, but involved since 2020. Um, and then you know, other kind of people um, uh, higher up kind of in the research team, um, there were some some shifts. Um, so, I mean, there there were some changes in the um, implementation and evaluation team, like on the ground, but we did continue to have like a, a core group of them consistent throughout the whole whole thing. And there were many Kind of levels to that hierarchy as well. There were people training, you know, enumerators, uh, people training the implementer. So there was there's all these kind of levels within goal, and then within our team working with goal uh, in the evaluation. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I just want to add that um, a retired professor, Greg at uh, the Feinstein, was the original on the original mm -hmm. co-creation team, and Greg retired. And uh, a lot of uh, researchers who were in Uganda work on it, then uh, got other projects and left. So that's part of the research team turnover. Great, Gottlieb. Ah, okay. Oh, no, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my question is about the process evaluation and the um, results from that. My question, I wonder, before or during the design of the intervention in this study, um, 
what considerations were made to tailor it possibly um, more comprehensively to the population or the location or um, so were there, are you all aware of the strategies taken to hopefully um, make it more sustainable um, beforehand as we know um, so much money is devoted to these large interventions. And of course we want them to be sustainable, um, but how do we do it beforehand in a, in a, I guess, a, like a formulation, um, formula, formulation research. Um, Formative. and, uh, yeah. So that's my question. Thanks. Carolyn, do you want to take that or? The process um, you know, sure I mean I think I can speak on it too, yeah I can speak briefly I mean so I don't know all of the details so this is gonna we're gonna start the answer with we'd have to find um, some very specific things about how it was built but I will say that um, goal so this was a unique situation in which goal was the program um, implementer right so they had this program nip they were already um, implementing or planning to implement in this area and so their like their program and our study sort of came together if that makes sense um mm. so uh, i'm sure that there was other you know i'm sure that there were some that, that was planning that happened in order to, to tailor it to the area and to the specific context and I think that what happens is that like you just can't catch everything. Um, you do the best that you can to like try to tailor to that area, and then and then things come up that that someone just didn't think about. But we can find out for sure the more more details about sort of what was changed for this specific program, um, and to implement it in this specific area because I know that they did um, they did have some considerations for sure. I don't know, Ian, if you had anything else you wanted to add. Yeah, kind of the same thing. But um, I think Goal Uganda created this initial program. So they have many people on their staff from Uganda, from the area. Um, and they, I believe they, uh, they worked with people from northern Uganda as well. And then people specifically from um, the sub-counties in the study were, you know, involved in implementing the progress. So there was, you know, I don't know a lot of details, but there there was maybe more involvement maybe than other studies. You know, it's not like we just went in and kind of uh, implemented this program based on our idea or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. There was a better analysis done. Um, and um, that was a part of co-creation. Yeah. Um, so um, I know Professor B. Rogers wrote many papers on sustainability. And there is um, uh, Rogers, um, uh, Jennifer, uh, Roger Cole's theory on sustainability. And I think um, future programs should consider that theory to implement it. Alina, do you want to ask your question next? Oh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> my question is more related to design. And I noticed in the title, it was RCT has been mentioned that as a primary design for the study. Now, it's very well known that, yes, so a desire to run the RCT is mostly driven by, you know, adherence to sort of uh, a, a design which will be more superior for assessing the causal relationship. However, it's very well known too that RCT are extremely expensive, very challenging mm -hmm. to build, especially in a field construct on a co community level. It's almost impossible to avoid, you know, like methodological contamination that one community is really similar or not similar to each other. There are a lot of um, sort of uh, there are a lot of uh, conversations and debate. Should we use RCT design? in this type of a settings, especially if it's RCT is not really helping you to achieve long-term goals. I'm curious about if you as a team talk about the design per se, the pros, cons, and do you see any other way of building the study which will you know, help you to, to build a capacity in a community and to ensure long-term effects? 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, good question. I, I think the RCT in this context really was beneficial and especially the clustered component, uh, which hopefully reduced some spillover effects because we had some distance um, between the clusters. Um, you know, for the most part, they, they were uh, using different water sources. Um, of course, there's a possibility for some spillover effects. Um, I think we found some evidence of that in the process eval. Um, but, you know, we, we were limited on statistical power, especially for some of our primary outcomes, which we're using a subsample. So we, we didn't get into that too much, but we had the overall 900 uh, for the maize aflatoxin and kind of all the, the behavior practice surveys, household and agriculture. Um, but then we had the subsample of 360 for the water contamination and the venous aflatoxin. Uh, so we were uh, limited there, but, you know, of course, we weren't just looking at p-values. So we, you know, we were looking at the, you know, um, effect estimates and, kind of taking in the whole uh, context there. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, there's opportunity for other study designs, but I think the, the randomization really helped us out here, especially in a, a multi-sectoral intervention when you're looking at so many different things can contribute um, to um, impacting these outcomes like weather, environment, you know, the climate and the season and, uh, and so um, I think that the randomization helped us out uh, a lot there, but we've definitely talked about within the RCT uh, structure, you know, how uh, things maybe could have been um, improved or done differently. I want to add that the original design of this study is to find evidence. And evidence in this day and age means different things to different people, different researchers, policymakers. Um, and um, our research group has been doing RCT in different contexts. So there's a lot of experience in doing RCT and we feel most comfortable doing RCT. Um, to um, Professor Elena's uh, point about very costly, it is extremely costly to do any sort of RCT. The alternative I can think of is longitudinal follow-up cohort kind of study. Um, I think strong, uh, well-designed, well-executed long-term longitudinal cohort is of great value. Um, so I think maybe um, that could be of consideration. I am glad you mentioned it because that's exactly what I was leaning to. Thank you very much. Feel free to raise your hand online or in the room if you'd like to ask a question or, yeah, okay, great. This is really great. Thanks for sharing. I'm really curious about the null results that Regina mentioned and what you guys learned from that and how those have um, been used or followed up on since the study. Yeah, so just as a reminder to everyone, we f did not find a positive intervention effect on household food security, maize yield, um, and then mm. the three child anthropometry outcomes of height for age, weight for age, and weight for height z-scores. So yeah, in my paper, I tried to hopefully explain why that was the case. Um, a lot of it, in terms of like food security, for instance, a major, and maize yield actually, major barriers economic. Um, mm. So even if you like, link people with these improved technologies. We didn't really supply much, unlike a lot of other studies that will actually, you know, either supply like whether it's cash payments or actual technologies, we did not do that. So there was definitely an economic barrier there. Mm. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the discrepancy, for instance, between like minimum dietary diversity, we did see improvements, but how was that the case with persistent household food insecurity um, that we think boiled down to the fact that minimum dietary diversity doesn't take into account food preferences or quantities or concerns over food availability. So that was some of what we found. I'm trying to think of. And then in terms of the child anthropometry metrics, those, like I said earlier, are pretty tough to move the needle on in that time frame. Um, MUAC tends to be a bit more responsive 
a bit sooner. So that was our suspected reasoning, or maybe the intervention did work. This is also all assuming, like, you know, I don't know. But I hope that does that come clear up a little bit. Yeah, I want to add on the no results. So there's a lot of discussion within our group. How do we explain this? How do we present this to the, our target audience, either go or policymakers who are reading this? Uh, what does it mean we spent all this money and you found nothing? Um, so mm. when we're looking at back about our intervention, the fidelity um, of the intervention, we acknowledge that um, the demo plots, we demonstrated what uh, fertilizer would do to your maize. We demonstrated what um, the improved seeds will yield better than you, the seeds you are using. Um, the demo plots were only shown once per week. So if you miss the first or the only session, you miss the whole thing. So mm -hmm. maybe we should go back and really implement that part of the demo plot to its uh, potential to do twice a week. Um, and we mm -hmm. found that we didn't pay the volunteers actually go um, link the farmers or the our target audience with the agriculture input dealers as much as we would like to. So they came, the agriculture input dealers came and talk about all those great things, hermetic bag, um, this um, expensive bag that you can buy to prevent aflatoxin, which not many people know which through our data that um, they know mold, but they don't know aflatoxin because aflatoxin is tasteless, but it's harmful. Um, mm. And a lot of people brew molded maize. That's what we see in the data. They brew molded maize and drink it. And it's a common drink in the area. Mm. So they co regularly consume this without the knowledge that it might cause harm. So, um, so many parts. We should build better linkages between farmer and agriculture dealer and um, uh, improve the linkage of, um, okay, now I have the maize. Where do I sell it? Where do I sell at the favorable price? Um, so those are the things we're going to explore and emphasize. I think that's where kind of this, uh, these interventions were different maybe than your your typical ones. We we weren't trying to, you know, rather, rather than just giving people cash or giving people the technology, we were trying to kind of work within the context to create that sustained change. Um, so ultimately, you know, that's, of course, a lot more complicated than just giving people uh, picks bags or water testing kits. Um, and we were trying to make those market connections, which broke down a little bit. Um, and I think that's really a big reason for our uh, aflatoxin null findings and probably mm -hmm. our lack of sustained um, impact in the water contamination outcomes. Yeah, I just have one question. So one of the things that you mentioned in the first slide, I think, was in terms of scale up of this intervention and what that would mean, like what that would kind of look like. And a question that I had was, again, it kind of comes back to study design with RCTs and, you know, how did you, so keeping in mind that one of the things you wanted to understand was scalability, how did you kind of take that into consideration with your, you know, external validity of the study and how did you think about that and what were your findings around that if you found anything at all? Great. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think Shabani, if you were here, would definitely speak better to that, the external validity piece. But um, I think we were, you know, obviously it's important to find interventions that work well in northern Uganda alone. There's many people who live there, very important, uh, large population. So uh, that was the first goal. But I think also there are many similar, you know, environments, similar areas uh, close by. Um, and, but um, I think, you know, so there's many similar contexts, you know, I think, I think that was the original um, kind of line of thinking. Um, you know, it's possible that some of the interventions would also apply to um, slightly different contexts. I think they would have to be reworked and changed a bit by, by goal. Um, and I'm not as familiar with that, but I don't know, did you have? I was just going to, yeah, yeah, the only other thing that I would add is that, um, so this is 
part of the reason that we added uh, that we put so much emphasis on things like the process evaluation, right? So it's mm. what is it that we can learn about what worked and what didn't, and maybe why it worked or why it didn't work. Um, that was really sort of a big piece of what we wanted to sort of concentrate on. If we figured out that something worked in this context, can we figure out why it worked in the context or Again, like we said, uh, for those things that we didn't find sort of some huge difference between the time points, is there a reason for that? And it, and what and what can we do about that reason, right? Mm. What what information can we give back to goal to say you can't just you know if you if you link people with seed vendors then the seed vendors have to have a reason to come back, right? So if these folks don't have an economic incentive to purchase the seeds, the vendors don't have an incentive to come back, right? So you have to figure out what of those pieces, and that's really what the process eval gives us is some of those reasonings so that we can formulate in partnership some ideas about how do you overcome these obstacles instead of just saying well it didn't work you know so mm -hmm. um that was that was part of the study design that we felt was really key to learning um sort of why things worked and didn't work that's fantastic b um do you want to have the last question quickly and quick answers well, and we'll we'll wrap well, up it in was two it was it was it's a very minor question but when you see a null result with a binary like women's dietary diversity, uh, anyone who's taken my class, I'm beating a dead horse here. Um, did you think about using it, measuring it continuously and seeing if there was a difference, even if it didn't bump them over or below a line? Yeah, so uh, for, we did with um, food household food security. So mm -hmm. we're using the HIFAS, the household food and security mm -hmm. access scale. And rather than assessing that categorically, because you can break it down into those mm -hmm. four yeah. categories, we assess that on a continuous scale, I think zero to 27 ah, is okay. the scale, just to try to capture those more like incremental yeah. intervention impacts. Um, unfortunately, we still did not see <laughs> okay, a result the there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and same with like child anthropometry, we weren't looking at the categorical, you know, buckets for, mm -hmm. Uh, malnutrition we were looking at those continuously yeah yeah as as much as we could we definitely erred on the side of continuous outcomes to try to capture smaller yeah we, we also looked at continuous for all the you know contamination outcomes but we were really powered on binary uh for the water for example and we also had clear cutoffs of you know um, that are often used um, for the maize aflatoxin and water contamination. But for Venus uh, aflatoxin, we did use a continuous measure. So, so I was actually curious, uh, you know, to what extent there was like an investigation to the like political component to this. I understand mm -hmm. that like, and I spent some time living in, in a village. I, I noticed that, oh, this family doesn't like this family and that clan doesn't get along with that clan. And and maybe, you know, they have different beliefs or lineages or languages and whatnot. Uh, to what extent could maybe political divisions or, or you know, some even intra-village intra strife contribute to uh, the, the results that, that were observed? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it, we definitely saw evidence of, you know, all kinds of different factors uh, interacting in uh, the results and kind of the note, we have tons of notes by enumerators too, like, oh, th that we couldn't have uh, foreseen necessarily. Um, we also, we didn't mention, but part of the intervention um, is a community level circle where like leaders in a community are uh, brought together. And so that didn't, uh, we didn't speak about it here, but that kind of gets at that too. And that was, so it wasn't only a multi-sectoral intervention, but it was also intended to be multi-level um, within household, individuals, households, and communities. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Can we have another round of applause? This was what an, yeah. What a fantastic, um, a fantastic seminar and a great just community discussion. I think people really, really enjoyed hearing about the intricacies of this fascinating project. So thank you again. And we hope to see everyone this time next week for our next seminar. Thank you.